Hello, and welcome to the Little Bighorn 2010 documentary. I am Bill Smith, an amateur historian and student in the life of George Armstrong Custer and his last battle. Now, before I begin the documentary, I would like to relay my personal history on the subject. When I was growing up in the 1980s, I had two great interests when it came to history. The first was the Titanic disaster, a situation where human complacency and every other form of mistake came together at a specific place and a specific time to create an unbelievable tragedy. The second was the Battle of the Alamo, a conflict in which every member on one side was annihilated. The combination of tragedy and mystery were riveting to me, and they still are to this day. Now, the Little Bighorn is quite like the two events that I just described. It was a battle in which everything went wrong, and everyone on one side was killed. So the Little Bighorn is filled with tragedy and mystery. So before I had even heard of the Little Bighorn, or George Armstrong Custer for that matter, the Titanic and the Alamo were the two main subjects that I was researching, but that would soon change. In 1985, to my great good fortune, Dr. Robert Ballard, an undersea geologist and explorer, a man that I have had the privilege of meeting, in fact, discovered the Titanic wreck on the North Atlantic. And I was very excited at that point, after studying the, the event for several years, to get a chance to see pictures of the ship on the bottom of the ocean. And in December 1986, I got my wish. It was in this ep issue, uh, 1986 December, the National Geographic, that uh, the first pictures of the Titanic were published. And, of course, I got the book and began going through the article, uh, checked out the ship itself. As you can see, the ship is in half on the bottom of the ocean. And uh, I basically dissected all the photographs because I really wanted to see exactly what the ship, the condition was. And I probably read this article ten times before finally putting it down. So, put the book down left it for a while. After a little bit, I came back to look at the book again, and I decided to go through some of the other articles that were in this issue. And there's a article on the Westminster Palace. There is an article on Halley's Comet, because it was 1986. That's the last time it came by. So that was interesting. Something about the TT fly, not that great. But as I went to the back of the book, I got to a subject article called Ghosts on the Little Bighorn. And uh, I thought it was a ghost story. So I figured, eh, it's a mystery, ghosts, might as well take a look at it. And I started reading it, and as I got through it, I realized that it wasn't a ghost story at all. It was actually a historic event, a battle, in which uh, a battalion of soldiers from a uh, cavalry regiment was annihilated to a man by uh, an American Indian force. And uh, the tragedy and the mystery, like I said earlier, just hooked me in. And there are also uh, maps in this issue. So it showed uh, where the people were killed and the suspected or supposed movements of the battle. And uh, it just hooked me in. I had, to, I had to know more about the situation and it's because of this book, this got me started to learn about Custer. Started here with the Little Bighorn, and uh, I've been researching him ever since. I started in 1986. That's when I. Uh, that's what I consider the anniversary, December 1986, that I started studying Custer, and uh, I've been studying him up until this point. It is uh, now July 2010, so in a couple months, in December of 2010, I will be uh, celebrating my uh, 24th year of study of Custer and the Little Bighorn. Now, after getting a chance to study the man in the event for almost 24 years now, it's given me a chance to actually collect a few things. As you can see, I'm surrounded by Custer and Little Bighorn memorabilia. I do have more in my collection than this, but I can't show you everything, because if I did, we'd be here all day. 
Uh, so I just want to go through some of these, uh, these paintings and other things that I have here. Uh, we'll start with the flags. Uh, this is an eBay purchase. I got this uh, a couple years ago. It has uh, the two main flags that the cavalry carried. Every uh, cavalry regiment carried a guidon, which is a swallowtail. It's created that way because on horseback it's harder to drag a rectangular flag through the air or through the wind. So the swallowtail allows you a little bit better movement. Every cavalry regiment carried guidons. Every company did. It's a 35-star guidon signifying uh, the end of the Civil War. Uh, the bottom flag is Custer's headquarters flag. And uh, this is a flag that Custer had uh, carried throughout the Civil War as a commander, and he was carrying it in the, uh, the Indian Wars as well after the Civil War. It's got the red and the blue and the cross saber signifying the cavalry. Here we have a larger replica of the Custer headquarters flag that was lost on Last Stand Hill with the Little Bighorn. Once again, cavalry swords, cross swords, red and blue. Now this guy over here, pretty big, three, three by four, or five by three. Uh, you wouldn't carry something like this in the battle, it's too big. You'd probably carry something more like this flag here, but this is, uh, once again, a replica of the 35-star guidon that the co companies carried for the cavalry. American flag, swallowtail as well, as you can see. It is a swallowtail. Uh, this flag here, once again, signifies kind of what the cavalry would have carried in the battle. It's a smaller flag, Custer's headquarters flag again. I bought this at the Little Bighorn in 2001 when I was at the Smithsonian tour with Edwin C. Bars, who is the uh, chief historian for the Department of the Interior and the Smithsonian Institution. So, buying that flag was great. It always reminds me of him. Now, coming back over here, we have interesting figurine of George Armstrong Custer. It's uh, almost like a G.I. Joe type doll. Uh, he has uh, several different things. He has his saber and his weapons, and uh, we are signifying him at the end of the Civil War here. He does have the distinctive uniform with the blue sailor shirt with the stars on the collars, the long, large sombrero hat that he always wore, the scarlet necktie that he wore, and you can change his uniform and boots and all that stuff. I've never taken it out. It's just a, a collector item to me, so all the pieces are still intact, all still tied down. 